the topic of my talk is quite different from what we have heard so far. Um, partly because I want to discuss the use of all the, uh, these uh, things in the toolbox, uh, not to cure uh, diseases, which has really been the topic of the conference so far, but to, to avoid them, to, to prevent us from, from developing these diseases. And of course, many of the techniques available now uh, are possible to put to that use, and are put to that use, or there are the prenatal diagnosis, uh, followed up by abortion, pre-implantation diagnosis, uh, with the selection of a healthy child rather than a, a sick child and so forth. So, so the techniques are with us, but, but uh, no one knows really what, what is waiting in the future. And many have comment on, uh, commented on this fact that we cannot really predict the future. Karl Popper, the philosopher, even um, partly as a joke, I think, said it is logically impossible to know what we will know in the future, because if we do, then we already know it. So, so that there is some logical even uh, po impossibility built into this knowledge about the future. But still, we could speculate, of course. And I've been into those discussions for quite a while, and I know that sometimes um, you, scientists, promised me that, that this will soon be, be done. For example, taking a simple blood test from, from a pregnant woman and to diagnose whether the child she's carrying uh, has uh, uh, a certain monogenetic disease. I was promised 30 years ago that we will do this very soon. And now it's happening, but 30 years afterwards. But then we have also Rutherford, the physicist, who claimed in the 30s that the atomic bomb was, was not only something that would not happen, it was impossible. So, so I mean, we should be prepared, I think, for, for also uh, a quick development sometimes, when, when, uh, and also prepare for it by thinking about the possibility. Uh, so I think there is a strong presumption, then, that, that's the point of departure of my talk, there is a strong pre presumption for doing what we can to obviate all those diseases and disabilities and so. Uh, I mean, we spend huge sums on healthcare, and it will become even more expensive, I fear, when I hear about cancer treatments of this individualized form and so. Uh, actually, I, I tend to believe that we make the wrong priorities, and that's the theme of a book, a forthcoming book. I think we should invest much more on, on mental disease, which, which is more, um, causing more unhappiness than, 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 than um, just trying to extend marginally our lives uh, a few years at old age and so so. But, but that's beside the point now. We spend huge sums on, on healthcare. We think it's well worth, but we also take costly preventive measures, of course, to safeguard a long and healthy life. And if we could obviate some at least of these costs and tend to opportunity costs instead that we now are paying, it would be terrific, I think. So there is a strong presumption in using all those resources in the toolbox to avoid diseases and disabilities, or so it seems. But are there any caveats then? Uh, uh, does the end really justify the means here? That's, of course, a very general way of putting the question. So which are the means then? Well, uh, only a few years ago, I think the, the hottest topic when I went to these kind of conferences uh, was the creation of artificial um, uh, sperms and eggs. Uh, uh, and then the idea was, perhaps still is in some quarters, uh, to, to breed human beings in the Petrus in the test tube, so, so to speak, generation after generation, and select for, for the uh, kind of offspring that a person really wanted to, uh, and then put it back into a womb and, and have it uh, born, uh, the, 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 the breeded, uh, as we do with, with cattle. But, but now I think germline gene therapy is back. I mean, that's always been a topic because of those new simple editing techniques. So perhaps this is the main. Um, measure that we should speculate about. But, but I leave that an open question. That's where your expertise lies, uh, about the exact way of doing those things. And um, perhaps we need to use embryonic stem cells, perhaps not. Uh, or if we do, so what? 
uh, well, this is the, the, the goal, I, f I think, that we should set ourselves uh, with regard to this entire field. And again, I don't say that we can do uh, all the things that, that I, uh, I think we ought to attempt to do, but, but we could certainly do some of it, and, and perhaps we could do everything. So, so we should speculate about all those possibilities that I will mention. Um, and then I will argue then in defense of something I call biological egalitarianism. I think we, and here some disambiguation is needed because this term has been used as the name of, of the, 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 the philosophical view or empirical view that there are no significant differences between human races. So that, that idea has been called biological egalitarianism. Which, by, <laughs> which might be a bad thing if you who advocated biodiversity yesterday are right. Then, then, then it's a sad thing that there is just one human race. It would be, have been better if there had been many races. I, I don't agree with that, but, but we had touched upon that issue yesterday. Uh, but my, my idea here is that we should attempt to level out natural differences between people with regard to important functioning in life and society. So that's really, I think, is the goal that should, we, we should have when, when we investigate the possibility of using these techniques to, to, to avoid diseases, disabilities, and so forth. We should level out between one another. And we should do it, I think, by leveling up. That's not quite obvious. We take intelligence, for example. Now some people claim that one reason why, why we might go extinct as a human race is our intelligence. So perhaps the best idea would to level down here, is to make us less intelligent, to save the planet and so on. But I, I mean, that's a non-starter, I think. We, we, so, so my idea is, is that these are, are the, the, the goals we should set ourselves. We should level up. Uh, level out between one uh, another by leveling up. Um, but then, and then we stay at least to begin with within what are natural biological variations. So it's not really um, going extinct, extinct as a human race and being replaced by, by some, some, some better creature. Uh, at least to start with, I think we should try to level out differences between ourselves, but, but within natural biological variations. And we should target, of course, diseases and disabilities. That's, that's I think, the, most, the least controversial part of this idea, that we should get rid of them if we can through all the methods you uh, are used to use already and those that are in the pipeline. We should also sharpen, I think, our memory, our IQ. I heard yesterday that it's not necessary to be intelligent anymore or to have a memory because you could carry it with you in external form. And, and that's true to some extent. But I think it would be fine if we could start out as uh, roughly uh, as intelligent as other people. We should improve our senses, of course, not only to cure blindness and deafness and so, but, but it would be terrific, I think, if I could have the eye of an eagle or something like that, and perhaps could see ultraviolet light and something. Well, that's a bit spectacular, but, but at least we should even out uh, again, level up. Um, and since, then something I think is extremely important, mood. Mood enhancement. We, we, should, we should help people who suffer from depression uh, which is, and other mental diseases, which is, I think, the most terrible burden of disease that we have in society. And I, I think it's a bad sign of the state of the art, so to speak, that we haven't touched upon it in this conference. I heard the word schizophrenia once yesterday, I think, but we haven't talked about mental disease. Instead, we talk about those advanced cancer uh, treatments that could extend marginally our lives. So we should help everyone to a good mood to the extent that it is possible. Should you also uh, strive for moral improvement? Well, no, I think, but, but that's a long story, so I, perhaps I could come back to it in discussion, but, but I just note that I'm not uh, supporting the idea of moral improvement. 
Suppose then that we play it safe here. These are, of course, obvious uh, restrictions. We, we need to take ordinary precautions when, when we do this. But, but suppose we do. Are there any principled objections to, to the kind of, of goal that I set for you uh, to, to level out uh, differences, to avoid diseases, disabilities, rather than curing them um, by avoiding having people born with uh, genes for those diseases? By the way, I learned just today that there are 1,000 mono monogenetic diseases. Uh, there was a time when I was told that there were hundreds of them. Uh, and I suppose that also opened up the field for, for, for all sorts of uh, diagnostic, uh, uh, pre-symptomatic diagnostic and diagnosis of parents that could uh, form a dangerous couple and, and could be advised to take precautions and so on. Well, yeah, uh, so things are happening in this field. And uh, it's difficult for, for a layman like me to keep up really what we're, you are doing. But are there any principled objections? And I, I, I focus then on three basic moral outlooks here. First of all, we have the ontology, the idea that there are uh, certain obligations that are binding for a human being, and you could realize it. Uh, theoretically, that there are things you are not allowed to do. That's really the core of this idea. There are absolute prohibitions, regardless, more or less, of the consequences of, of abiding by them. Uh, that's a theory propagated by Immanuel Kant, of course, and also by the Pope uh, and uh, Christian morality of a certain kind. The, the idea mainly is that the, the innocent human being must not be killed. That, that, that's a, uh, perhaps the most plausible part of it, but there are also other ideas, uh, as we will see, that have been, been uh, important in the discussion. We have more the right theories uh, to the effect that we own ourselves um, in a moral sense, and we are allowed to do whatever we see fit with ourselves, as long as we do not violate uh, similar rights of others. And we have utilitarianism, Peter Singer and me advocating it. So if you look to, uh, to the ontology, are there any good principled reasons to avoid uh, doing what I'm saying that we should do? Um, are there any absolute prohibitions that we would violate? I, I, I think that the destruction of embryos would be a problem to the Pope. Still, this Christian idea that uh, uh, the human innocent life is sacred, uh, would be violated in those cases. But, but there are ways, uh, I suppose, to avoid uh, using embryos, so it shouldn't be such a big problem. And to Kant, it is not a problem, because he's not interested in, in human beings as such, but in rational beings and, and the fetus. Uh, and of course, not an, an embryo is not a rational uh, individual who has that kind of right to life. But then we have this idea that we shouldn't play God or act against nature, as it's said sometimes. So that, that could perhaps be used as an argument against the idea that I'm advocating that we should level out differences, change our human natures in this sense. But I think this argument is really a non-starter, and that's been discussed so much uh, since the, the late 80s and up to now. I, I, I think the, the, there is no way really to... to to, to marshal this argument successfully against a project like the one I'm sketching here. Perhaps I just skip over it for that reason. This is perhaps a more, the moral rights theory is perhaps a more interesting idea about why we shouldn't meddle, for example, with the genome in germline uh, gene therapy, because it has been said that there is a right of human beings to inherit an unaltered genetic blueprint. It's even gone into legislation, and so European legislation. This idea that we have a right to a genome that has not been meddled with. Uh, now, my interest is not in, in law, but in ethics. Is this really uh, a plausible moral position to take up, that, that no one should have meddled with my genome if they did my right to a genome that had not been altered, uh, has been violated. I, I think this argument doesn't make much sense either. I mean, if there is a small intervention, for example, we had heard about uh, gene therapy curing blindness, or we could have deafness. If instead that ter therapy had been performed 
on the germ cell. So now I exist as a seeing person. I would have been blind had they not intervened, had they not meddled with my genome. Uh, well, from this moral perspective, we are allowed to, to, in, to enter the, um, the, the field of other persons with their permission. And I think in this case, it wouldn't be very difficult to obtain the permission afterwards by this seeing person. Uh, it would be strange if this person said that, no, you shouldn't have done this. I, I, I would have preferred to be blind. I think that would be very rare, at least, that it would happen. So perhaps you take a little more risk when you do this, but in most cases, uh, there, you would obtain the permission afterwards. And if there is a big intervention, or if there is the, the uh, use of, of prenatal diagnosis or pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, then, of course, the identity of the person depends really on what had happened before. I mean, have, had they not selected this embryo, but another embryo, then you wouldn't have existed at all. So then the question is, well, you could think that it would have been better if you had not been born at all. I mean, there are, of course, exceptional cases of that sort. There is also a Jewish uh, joke about this, that. Uh, Life is terrible, it would have been better not to be born, but who is as lucky as that? Not one in 10,000 or so. But th th there could be, of course, cases that it would be better not to have been born. But, but in most cases, if we are successful, then we have an individual who is healthy rather than, than another individual who is sick. So, so uh, there is no way for this other individual to, to enter the moral calculus here because it doesn't exist. So I think also this. Um, uh, moral rights theory um, doesn't really help us to, to a no to, to what I'm proposing. Then, of course, I'm a utilitarian, and, and uh, utilitarianism is the idea that we should maximize the sum total of happiness in the universe. Are we doing this if, if we follow my advice? Now, according to utilitarianism, then the end does justify the means. That, I mean, that's the, the really the point of this moral outlook. But, but is the end good enough? You could query, of course. And then perhaps it's not as good as it might seem. That might be a problem here, I think. Uh, with regard to diseases, I think definitely, yes. It's better not to, to suffer from cancer, better not to... To, to suffer from, from uh, um, all sorts of, of uh, well, all the kind of diseases that we have discussed, uh, and including, of course, uh, the mental diseases. It's better not to suffer that, from them than to do it. But, but with regard to improved functioning, perhaps it's not as good as one might at first believe, because we seem to have a strange capacity to, to adapt to our disabilities. So you could live a happy life, uh, if, you, if you suffer from, is perhaps not the right word, then the Down syndrome. If, if you uh, is a representative of Down syndrome, you could have a life that is as good as any one of us. If you're deaf, you have your deaf culture, you could live a good life. If you're blind, you could have, enter a kind of culture among blind people. And, and it seems as though it is possible to adapt. But then, of course, there is a cost side to it that, that at least the utilitarian must also consider. And, and this is really the tough message then that uh, suppose we have a person who has adapted, uh, but is dependent then on society and services of all sorts. So it's costly. Th then I often met patients in this situation and they say to me, uh, I agree that my life is costly to you, taxpayers and so, but I have adapted to my disability, I lead a good life. Is my life not worth the price, they ask me. And then my answer is yes, it is worth the price, indeed. The money spent on people in your predicament are well spent, but then that's the problematic part of it. However, if we could have obviated the disability, we would also have obviated the costs. And we could have tended to opportunity cost instead. For example, people who have, after all, ended up in this situation. And then the, the, the response is often, do you threaten to kill me? 
But that is not really the message. But it's extremely difficult in discussion to keep these two thoughts together at one time, that it is cost effective to spend on people in this situation. But it would be better if th there weren't so many people around with this predicament. So my different message is different. Your life is well worth living, and the spending on it is worth the cost. However, this is not a reason to create more people in your predicament if we don't. So do so, then more resources will be available for you. So th there, I think the cost-benefit analysis enters the pictures in a way that shouldn't be seen as a threat to people with disabilities, but is often seen as a threat. So here is an ex extremely difficult uh, um, pedagogical um, problem, really, to, to, to communicate this message. And then we have, of course, the problem with the, only, uh, the rich can avail themselves of this. But this is, I think, a general political problem and not really a problem for these techniques and these ambitions. Uh, perhaps it's not as severe as one might at first believe, since new techniques spread extremely quickly now. I mean, we, uh, they invented the, the iPhone. We all carry it now. Uh, the, uh, and, and I think the same would really be with this uh, intervention, I suggest. And, and also the fact that, uh, th that um, it's an egalitarian idea that we should level out differences by level up. So we all get the same capacities for, for, for leading different lives. I c if I wish I can be a philosopher, but I, I could also be a solo clarinetist uh, um, because my... my Nature doesn't block either of these, these careers, as it does right now. Actually, I would have liked to be a solo clarinetist. Uh, so we also have radical life extension. I mean, much of the arguments here for marginal life extension, I think, uh, is that in the long run it will lead to, 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 to uh, radical life extensions, 200 years, 300 years or so. I think it's, it's, it, this is the terrible idea. It's a lousy idea. It's really not desirable to have it. So that's another reason for being skeptical uh, with regard to, to marginal life extension. We should rather spend again, I say, on, on mental diseases. And so we, we, we gain very much happiness with, with rather simple means also. Uh, so it's not desirable uh, with life extension. And, and the problem is, of course, that, that if, if we don't let go, we won't leave room for, for uh, coming generations. And we are not as good as they are in transforming material resources into happiness. We become bored, and, and it's impossible for us, I think, to, to really live. We could live lives that are good, but they are not good enough because our children, our grandchildren, so we live better lives. So we should let go. But I'm certain that we won't. So th this is really a dystopia, I say, coming here because people have some, such fear of death and, and the resistance to this idea of letting go when the possibility to stay uh, around uh, develops. So, so I, my conjecture is that in the very long run, this is what will happen, and it's bad. So the take-home message is that we ought to level out biological natural differences. There are no good principled reasons not to do it. We ought to level up rather than down. I haven't really argued for that, but I think that's the obvious solution. The service should be available to all. It should not be mandatory. So it should not be a genetic drive towards this goal, but, but it, it should be... Uh, uh, man, uh, provided as a service, and I think most people would avail themselves of it when it's safe and, and, and uh, not costly. The society should really pay for it in a welfare state, I think. And we should, if possible, but I think it's impossible, avoid uh, attempts at radical life extinction. Thank you. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. I, I, I will also keep my eye out for your, your upcoming book, because I think this setting priorities in healthcare, it's a very uh, deep and it's also a topic that's going to be very relevant more and more, I think. Uh, are there any questions for Torbjorn from the audience? Bjorn. Uh, a quick question. Thank you for a very interesting lecture, as always. Uh, uh, in your d difficult message slide, how do you extend that into severely unhealthy lifestyles driving costs? If it's shortening lifespan, I'm sure it could be favorable <laughs> in, in some of your conclusions. But how do you extend that? Could that be uh, philosophically a pressure to, 
to actually uh, adapt to uh, um, lifestyles that will not drive societal costs? I think we have a moral, ob moral obligations to, to be healthy. <laughs> And personally, I exercise and do whatever I can. But I also realize that, that there are so many other factors here. So it might, it, it might very well be in vain, I mean, because of my natural constitution and so So, so it would be better if I know, knew more about the effects of it. But, but yes, I, I think there is a moral drive towards that. But, but that's one thing. And another thing where the society should impose things on it. There are many things in medicine that we have tried to impose on people from, from uh, compulsory steri uh, com uh, sterilizations programs and so on. And, and they have proved terrible even though sometimes the motives behind them have been good. So I think uh, I also always advocated that we should have, have a total uh, reproductive uh, license, you could say, freedom. Any Andreas? Uh, Andreas Namslauer, Stockholm Science City Foundation. W won't there often be a problem deciding what is leveling up? Uh, for yes. example, when it comes to psychological variations and things like that. Yes, I, I think, I mean, perhaps there are some clear cases and there, that's where you should start. People are clinically depressed, for example. That's a terrible state to be in. Um, and uh, if you could make enhance their mood up to something more normal, so to speak, uh, that's fine. But really to find, the, I mean, and then we have the problem, for example, with deafness and so where, where I often encounter people who think that uh, there is no up and down here. I mean, it's no better being hearing than being deaf. Uh, so, so they even question whether, whether, whether the endpoints are, are clear. Uh, there, there are lots of problems of that kind, but, but I think, one shouldn't emphasize them too much because they're also very much rather mundane and simple cases where we would all, all almost all agree about the direction. And, and of course, if you have a free liberal system where people make their own choices, society need not really decide about what is up or what is down on the scales, it just provide the services. I have a comment. Uh, I had never heard of the, this moral rights theory, but the, the idea that a, a, a child would have a, a right to an unaltered genome, I think that's quite a, an interesting idea. Uh, you kind of dispelled it a bit. But then I also thought about epigenetics, and, and somehow it feels like we're already giving altered genomes through epigenetic. Uh, mm. From what I understand about epigenetics, it is, a, it is transferred to the, to the child, so the epigenetic state. So it just felt like we've already crossed that barrier uh, when we discovered about epigenetics, I think. Yes, in a way. I mean, yes, you, you, you provide your kid with, with genetic material by your lifestyle. It, exactly. Right, that's what I meant, so, yes, exactly. Yes, that you've yes. made choices in your life. Yes, that yes, do, yes, it's not, yes, you're not yes. snipping the genome, but you yeah. are affecting it. And I think it's difficult uh, to understand why we should pick on just this special point. I mean, what don't our parents do to us in so many other mm. ways? So could this be so important? Mm. Yeah, it's true. Okay, I think we thank Torbjorn again for an interesting presentation.